Hello and welcome to The Viewpoint. I'm your host, Rifat Malik, here on Radio Caravan, 104.1 FM and 700 AM, as well as worldwide on our free app. Every weekday Thursday at 2 p.m., we bring you expert views and analysis of all the latest local and national stories. And we'd love to hear your views on all the issues we cover. Now, before we get to our guest interview today, let's have a brief look at some of the week's headlines. The president has backed a reported FBI investigation into the circumstances surrounding the dismissal of all 16 criminal charges against actor Jesse Smollett. Local prosecutors in Chicago have defended their decision to let Smollett go scot-free after completing just community service and paying a $10,000 bond. Smollett's attorney is insisting the actor did not fabricate the incident, which allegedly involved hiring two men to stage a racist, homophobic attack against him in downtown Chicago earlier this year. But the city's mayor, Rahim Emanuel, said dropping the charges against the actor made fools of all of us and was a whitewash of justice. But he also attacked the president this morning, accusing him of exploiting the situation for political mileage. The former vice president, uh, Joe Biden, has condemned a white man's culture as he lashed out at violence against women and more specifically regretted his role in the Supreme Court confirmation hearings that undermined Anita Hill's credibility nearly 30 years ago. Biden, a Democratic presidential prospect who often highlights his white working class roots, said Professor Hill, an African-American attorney who accused Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment during his then confirmation hearing, should not have been forced to face a panel of white guys. His comments echo sentiments he expressed last fall as the nation debated sexual misconduct allegations against Brett Kavanaugh amid his Supreme Court confirmation hearing. Kavanaugh was, of course, later confirmed. The U.S. Senate defeated a motion to take up the Green New Deal, the non-binding proposal spearheaded by progressive Democratic lawmakers to radically reduce greenhouse gases and try to lessen social inequalities. During a fiery speech, Congresswoman Ocasio Cortez said that climate inaction meant people are dying. Lawmakers ultimately voted 57 to 0 against the proposal, which aims to virtually eliminate poisonous emissions by 2030 and calls for the U.S. to shift away from fossil fuels such as oil and coal. It also urges national health care coverage and job guarantees, high-quality education and affordable housing, as well as upgrading buildings to be energy efficient. That's all for the headlines now for the Viewpoint in Focus story. Over 500 witnesses, more than 200 subpoenas, after 22 months and 25 million tax dollars, the outcome of the much-awaited Mueller report was no collusion, no obstruction, complete and total exoneration, keep America great. Those are, of course, not my words. That was the gleeful presidential tweet that followed the Attorney General releasing a four-page summary of the findings of the Mueller investigation this past weekend. The investigation was commissioned to assess wrongdoing and conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russians in the 2016 presidential race. But while the question of collusion seems to have been settled, is the question of obstruction of justice over? And was this a complete exoneration, as the president claims? With me to analyze all this is the brilliant political correspondent for The Guardian newspaper based in Washington, D.C., Sabrina Siddiqui, who is also a CNN contributor. Welcome to The Viewpoint, Sabrina. Sabrina? Yep, I'm here. Thank you so much for having me. No, uh, great to have you. So um, my first question to you, Sabrina, is um, as a journalist who's been avidly reporting on this story for all these months and also as a political pundit, were you blindsided by the findings? I would say that a lot of reporters who've been covering this issue for the past two years were expecting there to be more uh, in the report. Now, the caveat is, of course, that we haven't actually seen the full report. What we've seen is a four-page letter from the Attorney General William Barr, a political appointee of the president, summarizing the special counsel's findings. And we just learned today that the special counsel report 
is more than 300 pages. So it goes without saying that four pages uh, provides a very minimal glance at what might be in that report. Uh, but it does say, uh, and this was what surprised many, that the special counsel did not reach a definitive conclusion on whether the president obstructed justice, that they found evidence on both sides of the issue, and that they did not find a criminal conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. Mm -hmm. And and on the point of, uh, you know, criminal conspiracy first, um, you know, do you subscribe to the theory that while there may not have been a concerted, um, you know, formalized, structured conspiracy with the Russians, there were plenty of sort of haphazard random attempts, for instance, you know, meeting the Russians in Trump Tower and then misrepresenting the purposes of that meeting and then later on finding out that President Trump may well have uh, helped write um, the, the, the letter explaining what the purpose of that meeting was. There was also the example of, um, you know, the president very publicly calling on WikiLeaks to find Hillary Clinton's missing emails. There certainly seems to have been plenty of smoke to support the argument for a conspiracy. I think that there certainly was a clear pattern of contacts between either members of the Trump campaign or associates of the president and individuals who were directly linked to the Russian government or who had known ties to Russian intelligence, others being Russian oligarchs, some of whom were sanctioned by U.S. banks or by the U.S. government, I should say. Mm -hmm. So there, there definitely is an open-ended question as to what the special counsel made of all those contacts. You just mentioned some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Manafort, when he was at the helm of the Trump campaign, was sharing internal polling data with Konstantin Kalimnik, who is one of those uh, Russian associates that had known ties to Russian intelligence. And there's, of course, the infamous June 2016 meeting at Trump Tower, which Donald Trump Jr., the president's son, accepted after he was offered incriminating information on Hillary Clinton and informed of an effort by the Russian government to help elect his father. So, uh, we, you know, it, it could be that they couldn't establish a criminal conspiracy, which is incredibly difficult to prove uh, that they were willingly colluding with the with Russian government. But perhaps the special counsel did believe that there were forms of coordination um, that didn't amount to a, a criminal conspiracy and fell short of that, but that were cause for concern or cross other legal boundaries. And we just don't know that because they have not put out the full report and the Attorney General has not indicated how much of that report he's going to make public. So I think that's what's really going to be uh, the next major front in this uh, in this battle to come. Yeah. So, so the, uh, on down the point of the charge of uh, obstruction of justice, we heard from Robert Comey, the former FBI director, who was um, um, obviously terminated by the president, he is insisting he was right to in initiate the investigation into Trump and his campaign and that um, he expected that the special counsel would have subpoenaed the president for an interview at least. And also um, it was his job to make a judgment on the issue of obstruction of justice rather than leaving it to, as you said, uh, someone like uh, w uh, B Bill Barr, who is a political appointee. Do you agree with that view? Yes, I think so. I think that in some ways what's happened here is people are kind of losing sight of why this investigation began, which is, uh, well, there were two portions of this investigation. There was the, F the federal government's investigation into potential collusion between the Trump campaign and Moscow, and more specifically Russian interference in the U.S. election. Uh, and that was launched when George Papadopoulos, uh, a former foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, bragged about how he was aware that the Russian government was trying to help elect Donald Trump. And then when the president fired James Comey, uh, who the FBI director who in the beginning of his presidency was overseeing this Russia investigation, uh, that's when special counsel Robert Mueller was appointed to see and determine if, among other things, uh, the president had obstructed justice. And, you know, it, you had a lot of turnover in the course of when this investigation began to where we are now. And one of those individuals who's come into the picture more recently, as you point out, is William Barr, who replaced Jeff Sessions, um, the president's former attorney general. And with Barr, I think what this really gets to is what was the sticking point during his confirmation battle, that he never really uh, committed to making this report public, that he seemed to be uh, heavily in favor of a pretty... Uh, I'd say expansive view of presidential powers and that he 
was very clearly against the obstruction line of inquiry that Mueller was pursuing. In fact, he authored a pretty significant memo in the summer of 2018 criticizing the obstruction aspect of Mueller's investigation. So I think that Democrats are arguing that this is what they feared all along, that this is now an effort to protect the president. And until and unless every, the public is able to see that report, uh, we, we won't really know the full extent of what the special counsel found and whether there may, in fact, be cause for charges against the president or other individuals who are in his inner circle. Um, and as you say, that there is now a, a battle waging between the Democrats and um, the, the lawyers, basically, for, for the government, who uh, are... Um, resisting so far attempts to get the report published. The Democrats did give a deadline of the 2nd of April. It doesn't look like that's going to be met. Are we confident that this report, the full report, will be published uh, and in its entirety? Well, you can't say that with certainty. Republicans and Republicans keep saying that the report will be released uh, in its entirety that Democrats are just sounding the alarm uh, for political reasons. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, the big question really is whether or not they uh, withhold significant parts of the full report under the guise of it being classified. Uh, you know, they could redact a great deal of portions of this report and say, well, that's because there's very sensitive counterintelligence information that we can't make public. And the question becomes, is that in fact true or are they perhaps applying too generous a read of sensitive information and what is perhaps really an effort to try and prevent information that incriminates the president or his associates from coming out. Uh, And I think that's where a lot of this battle might be headed. Now, it it goes without saying that this is going to be challenged in the courts if they really do resist, uh, the Justice Department, that is, and the White House, for that matter, efforts to make this report public in as much of its entirety as can be. Uh, and then it is something that will be litigated in the courts and potentially could make its way all the way to the Supreme Court. Having said that, the Supreme Court is uh, now in a decidedly conservative fold mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, has two justices who were appointed by this president. Right, right. Uh, so so it, you know, we don't know how they might uh, rule on this matter. I mean, this is something that could take months, perhaps longer. Um, if, that is, of course, all if the Justice Department really does push back and if the White House tries to invoke executive privilege say that these are convers- the president is protected in his conversations uh, in the White House to a certain extent. Uh, but again, they, they might just, it, it all depends on how much they try to apply uh, those rules or enforce those rules and whether they're uh, being genuine or in, in those interpretations or whether they're simply trying to mislead the public. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the, the sort of uh, slightly ironic um um, uh, sort of uh, out- outcomes of this whole Mueller report is that I think just days before, maybe even hours before the report was published, we had the president on a major offensive uh, denouncing Mueller, um, calling him, you know, conflicted and compromised and, uh, you know, all kinds of charges. And um, I think after the, the after the report or the summary of the report was published, um, he, he's not so uh, he's not so against him. Sorry, can you repeat that last part? I, I was just I saying that that, that that you know before the the Mueller report or the summary was published, we had oh, yeah. Yeah, we had uh, the president on a major offensive against Mueller. Yeah. But once it came out, the report came out, and it was obviously favorable to him. He wasn't such an awful mm. person, right? Exactly. It's amazing how the tides <laughs> turn when you feel as though the decision has been uh, in your favor. Now. I, I think that this would look very different if uh, Mueller had more explicitly recommended charges of obstruction of justice against the president, um, or perhaps if William Barr's letter had read differently. Uh, one thing to remember is that all we know is that Mueller said that there were was evidence on both sides of the obstruction issue, um, and he made it very clear that he was not exonerating the president. It was William Barr who took it a step further and made his own determination in this summary that he did not believe uh, that the evidence Mueller found was sufficient enough to prosecute. So so that's actually Barr's interpretation that Trump is so pleased with. Now, the no collusion part, the no criminal conspiracy, uh, that's something I'm sure that the, the president is happy to 
Baskin because he said all along that there was no collusion. Again, we don't know if Mueller actually had caveats to that statement and mm-hmm. that there's a lot more in the report right. uh, than just that there was no criminal conspiracy. But yes, I mean, he was on, the president led a, an almost two year crusade against Robert Mueller trying to discredit him in his investigation. Uh, now he's singing his praises, but he also has a rally this evening in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he's probably going to take a pretty significant victory lap. And we'll have to see what he has to say about the special counsel uh, during those remarks. Yeah, I think uh, it was um, um, uh, Bannon who said that he was going to go, the president was going to go full animal, whatever that meant. So I think today at the um, uh, at this rally, he will uh, he will unleash himself. Um, one question I wanted to ask you, the Republicans and, of course, the president are currently after Adam Schiff, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. Um, is he in any danger? I mean, there was a vote to try to unseat him uh, earlier today. Uh, is this just political posturing? Uh, it's largely political posturing, I think you can say. Um, I, uh, look, I think that there is obviously an effort by Republicans to say, we told you all along that Democrats were uh, leading witch hunts against the president, and they were making all these claims of collusion and of obstruction that were not necessarily proven. Uh, and, and now we've, we've found that those claims were either false or overblown, and so they want to use that to their advantage and try and milk it for all it's worth, and part of that means this campaign to have Adam Schiff step down as the Intelligence Committee chairman when, one, that's not going to happen, two, Adam Schiff was still very cautious in what he said all along. Uh, I I think think a lot of this is about interpretation. There are other people who look at the actions of Mm -hmm. both the Trump campaign and the president himself and say that there was some either evidence of coordination or willingness to collude um, and that there was perhaps obstruction of justice. Uh, I think that many of the Democrats might read this report very differently and believe that the president did, in fact, obstruct justice. They won't have the same interpretation as William Barr. So, you know, I, 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 this is also part of an effort by Republicans to cast this as a post Mueller era right. um, when, in fact, we're far from beyond it. And I don't think you're going to see Democrats back down anytime soon most certainly when we still haven't seen the report. Right, right. I want to shift a little bit and um, ask, uh, get, get your sort of take on the two newly elected congresswomen uh, who caused quite a bit of stir in Washington. I'm referring, of course, to Ilhan Omar and Rashida Talib, who made political history as the first Muslim women elected to Congress. Do you think they've been treated fairly? I think that they have certainly attracted a great deal of scrutiny. Um, in the beginning, they, they were very much covered as trailblazers, which they are. They're the first two Muslim women elected to the U.S. Congress. Um, and their stories have been very compelling, and, and that's how they were covered as sort of this new, uh, the new faces of an increasingly diverse uh, freshman class. They have, at the same time, been more than willing to be in the headlines and make statements that would put them in the headlines. Uh, Rashida Tlaib, of course, using an expletive that I don't repeat um, to mm-hmm. talk about the president and calling for impeachment, uh, which was always bound to get <laughs> attention. Yes, right. it's true that the president gets away with saying and doing almost anything, and he's really lowered the bar for the kind of language that's accepted in political discourse. But I think many people thought you you don't need to, one, uh, think to the same level, and two, you, you don't need to use the F word when you're talking about the president. Uh, regardless of how you feel. And then with Ilhan Omar, it's, uh, and even with Rashida Tlaib, it's a lot to do with the issue of Israel and U.S. policy in Israel. I think that Ilhan Omar apologized for the comments she made that trafficked in Jewish stereotypes, recognized that as a member of Congress she should know better. But at some point, there was an effort by Republicans to frame anything she said as, as anti-Semitic, and yeah. that any criticism she was making of the Israeli government, of the occupation of the West Bank, and of the unwavering support that the U.S. government has had for Israel that any of those criticisms could be were anti-Semitic when, in fact, the underlying points she was making are actually uh, increasingly the belief of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and there's also a generational split with an increasing number of young Americans also holding that same view that she was trying to espouse. So uh, perhaps you can say Republicans overplayed their hand because at some point the attacks became Islamophobic, and I think the media sort of course corrected a little bit and, and did not... Uh, buy into the same level of outrage every time either of those two open their mouths on Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, 
it's only just beginning. Uh, they've only <laughs> been here for less for three months. Yeah. So uh, less than or about three months now. So I, I'm sure it was not the it's neither the first nor the last time that we'll be having this conversation. Yeah. And and we'll have to see if they continue to scapegoat these two women in particular. When if any other member of Congress had said what they had said about Israel, you'd be hard, you'd be hard pressed to think that it would have gotten the same amount of coverage. Yeah. And you were talking about, I mean, they've certainly knocked that stereotype that, that Muslim women are passive and, um, uh, you know, aren't able to speak up for themselves. So that is a positive. Um, on the question of Ilhan Omar in particular, because uh, obviously wearing a hijab, she is more overtly uh, religious. Um, she attracted particular uh, um, attention, negative attention. Uh, I, there was a, um, a an incident where Judge Janine on the Fox News channel had called uh, her wearing the hijab, an example of being Sharia compliant. Um, I just wondered um, how you felt about or what was your assessment of the way that she was being targeted in particular? You know, I think that this, that's a really interesting point you make because a lot of this question of um, Ilhan Omar and the comments that she made had to do with this idea, which is true, that you know, it's a long-standing trope uh, to suggest that Jewish um, Americans have dual loyalty. Right. Uh, that was sort of at the heart of this this controversy, right? Mm-hmm. A- at the same time, the attacks on Ilhan Omar were doing that just that, yeah, suggesting exactly. that she has dual loyalty, yeah. that she, you know, is, is has, has ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, that she is first and foremost, uh, you know, faithful to her faith, to Islam, and before she is faithful to the United States of America and to the Constitution. And so, you know, a lot of what you saw was actually, uh, I'd say, disproportionately Islamophobic um, in terms of the conversation around Ilhan Omar and the, and the way in which she was targeted in particular. And, and I don't think that that got, ever got the level of current coverage that was really warranted. Yeah. Um, I think you saw it sort of rise a little bit more to the surface when Democrats were weighing and eventually voted on the resolution condemning hate <laughs> speech of all kinds. Right, right, right. Um, they sort of had their own, they sort of made it about all you know, forms of discrimination and not just anti-Semitism, but also Islamophobia. And they refused you know, to name. Anti-white nationalism. They yes. didn't name her, but it was very clearly about her. Exactly. Um, so, so, so I think that that sort of led into more of a conversation around the reckoning within the party of, you know, where where are we crossing the threshold of now in, in, in defense of the Jewish people now and, and in speaking out against anti-Semitism now crossing into the terrain of perhaps ex- be engaging in or, or allowing Islamophobic attacks to go unchecked. So, you know, she clearly was targeted in a way that, that no one else would be. Um, and, I, and I think that that's going to continue to happen. Uh, yeah. The way that Republicans are targeting her, trying to link every House Democrat to, to her and her views as if she's some sort of extremist, and even just the word extremist to describe a hijab-wearing Muslim woman mm-hmm. who's a member of Congress, you know, it's all very charged. It's, yeah. it's thinly veiled, to say the least. Yeah. Um, but I think I'd hope that there's, there's been at least somewhat of a, a, a learning curve given the way in which the conversation around her and her comments really evolved over the course of a few weeks. Yeah, and I think that the Democratic Party themselves have had to sort of look a little inwards and look at their stances on um, issues. Um, And I noticed that um, a number of the Democratic uh, presidential candidates uh, did actually boycott uh, APAC um, this year. Is that right? Yes, and I think that the way in which APAC then openly went to war with Ilhan Omar, um, I think that that was uh, overplaying their hand. Uh, I think she was trying to make a point about lobbyists, pro-Israeli lobbying in Washington, which is very real. Um, You know, she, 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 she should not have, clearly should not have said it's all about the Benjamins and um, and, and made those comments that, as we as we noted, uh, do traffic in anti-Semitic tropes. But the underlying point she had to make had to do with lobbyists and yeah. the uh, the amount of influence they have over lawmakers on Capitol Hill. And so, you know, APAC is part of that, even though they don't directly yeah. uh, donate to candidates. They do fund what are known as educational trips to Israel yeah. for members of Congress and their staff, which and they, and they lobby very aggressively. Yeah. No, yep. I, thank you so, so much. That is a wonderful yeah. point. We're actually running out of time. This show went just flew by. You, thank you for uh, your insight. 
Absolutely wonderful to hear from you. We hope you come back on the show again. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you to our guest, Sabrina Siddiqui from The Guardian newspaper. We will hopefully see you next week, Thursday, 2 p.m.